All right, well, our theme for 2020 is seeing spiritually. What we see is not all there is. Right now, 2020, we are already in the fall season, if you can imagine that. And we're celebrating the Lord's feasts. You know, if you have ever thought about it, we place so much value on things that are passing away. So much value on material things, on possessions. But all of these things are passing away. But God's word is eternal. The feasts of Israel and the biblical calendar are not just for the Jews, but they also outline God's plan of redemption throughout history. Just a little review. The Feast of Trumpets reminds us that Jesus is coming again, right? The Day of Atonement reminds us that God has written our names in the book of life. The Feast of Tabernacles, then, is the celebration of the culmination of fellowship and relationship with God. If we're going to see spiritually, we need to be looking not only at what God is doing in our lives now, but also have the perspective of knowing that we are going to share an eternity with him and with each other. The Feast of Tabernacles transcends time and ties the events of the past, present, and future together so that we celebrate the past, are revitalized in the present, and anticipate the future with great joy. This is a season of joy as it's the culmination of everything that God has purposed through the ages. I'd like to take us to Deuteronomy chapter 16. I'm going to begin in verse 13. You shall keep the feast of booths, tabernacles, booths, same thing. Keep the feast of booths seven days. When you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press, you shall rejoice in your feast you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast of the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful." Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Weeks. Feast of Unleavened Bread is in the spring. That's Passover. The Feast of Weeks is summertime. That's Pentecost. And the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. First of all, celebrating the past. Remember that this life is temporary. Temporary is your fill in the blank there. The Feast of Tabernacles is called Sukkot in Hebrew. Sukkot uh, referring to booths or tabernacles. Uh, The word in Hebrew is sukkah. And a sukkah is the kind of structure that's describing there. We loosely translate tabernacle as tent, but actually tent is another word in Hebrew. A sukkah, sukkah in Hebrew literally means woven together. It's a temporary structure with a light framework and a semi-open roof structure. In order a proper sukkah, you're supposed to at least be able to see some stars through the roof. You know, it's not supposed to be completely closed off. It was like the booths used by vendors in the marketplace, primarily for shade. Its purpose is shade, temporary shelter. It is not permanent. So the first lesson of Sukkot is to remember that we are temporary in this life. We are just passing through. Paul reflects on this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 5. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. 
if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. (laughs) I remember a fellow who was a mentor of mine. When he passed away, his son at the funeral said, you know, we get so attached to these bodies. (laughs) We get so attached to our physical existence and everything that we have and everything that we know. I have a car at home that I've had for 15 years and I'm probably going to be trading in in the next week and I'm, I'm there looking at this vehicle and thinking about all of the memories that I have <laughs> in this vehicle and it's like I can become attached to something like a car you know that I've had for 15 years. Think about how we are with our bodies with our tent that is just temporary. But all of this is meant to prepare us for eternity. What is this life anyway? This life is a dress rehearsal to prepare you for life with God. It's not that your life now is not important. It is. But it's really, it's just the warm-up for eternity. You are not yet clothed with your supernatural body. You're still in your earth suit. (laughs) But, Paul says, we have a foretaste of what is to come. And that is the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. That's just a foretaste of what we have to look forward to. Here's another point when you think about life being temporary. Remember what it was like in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 8.2 says this, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. God led Israel through the wilderness for 40 years until they would enter the promised land. Future generations would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles just after taking in the year's harvest. Part of that celebration would be telling the stories. Remember when we didn't have a harvest? Remember when we ate manna? Remember when we went out each day and just gathered what we could for that day because we weren't in our own land where we could plant and harvest? God provides for us in the wilderness. But don't ever forget that when times are good and you're living in your promised land. Sometimes, you know, (laughs) we tell the stories to our kids, you know, what it was to struggle, what it was to just feel like we were barely surviving, you know. That's describing the wilderness. But don't, you don't want to forget those times when you're in that time of plenty when you're in that time of abundance. You want to always remember how the Lord provided for for you. The wilderness is a place of testing and learning to humbly trust God. Does everyone have to go through their own wilderness? I think to some extent that's true. But you know, we also go through those wildernesses in hopes that future generations will not have to suffer in exactly the same ways that we have. We hope that future generations can learn the lessons from us that we learned in the wilderness so that they won't have to relearn all of those lessons. If we learn the lessons of the wilderness, we don't have to relive the wilderness. 
celebrate the goodness of God. Manna was a miracle from heaven. But at the time, it probably just felt like survival. I'm not sure that it felt like a miracle, but it was a miracle. Remember, their clothes didn't wear out either. But that's a fact that can only be recognized and celebrated when you're looking back. My friend, Pastor Mark Jai Kumar, whom we're going to hear from next week, likes to say, if you pass the test, you can enter his rest. (laughs) But there's been a lot of tests along the way. Pastor Mark has some stories that will just amaze you, tests that he's been through. Next fill in the blank, remember how God has been with you. God has been with you. The sukkah is also a reminder of the presence of God. During the wilderness journey, there was a cloud that covered the tabernacle. You remember that? Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38 describes this. Then a cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of God filled the tabernacle. Throughout all of their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day when it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. You know, the tabernacle itself was not so much a sukkah. It was more of a tent. But there was a shade covering over the tabernacle. The very presence of God is what is represented in the sukkah. God gave them shade. God gave them protection from the heat, literally, in a cloud over the tabernacle over the encampment. The cloud also filled the tabernacle with the glory of God. And they followed the cloud wherever it went. It was the very presence of God that led them through the wilderness. So Jesus is the embodiment of what the sukkah represents. Listen to this in John chapter 1, 14. And I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible so you get the amplified version of it and the word Christ became flesh human incarnate and tabernacled fixed his tent of flesh lived a while among us and we actually saw his glory his honor his majesty such glory as an only begotten son receives from his father full of grace favor loving kindness and truth He came and he lived among us. Think of it as a family celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. You are around the table with your family and Jesus is there with you. As you're visiting from sukkah to sukkah, sharing stories with friends. Jesus is there with you. As you're praying and thanking God for his goodness and the abundance that we all enjoy, Jesus is there with you. He lived for a time in the same tents that we do. He had an earth suit. And that was his wilderness experience. But now he is preparing for us eternal dwellings. And not only that, but he has given us all that we need for life in the here and now. Leads to the second part of this message, revitalizing the present. First of all, let's discover the source of life. That word is source. Here's a a scripture that comes from the Feast of Tabernacles. John chapter 7, 37 to 39. 
On the last day of the feast, now that was the Feast of Tabernacles, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Feast of Tabernacles at the time of Jesus involved more than just camping out in sukkahs. They had some really elaborate ceremonies that were part of the the temple and the whole temple complex and people coming to Jerusalem uh, as pilgrims. Um, The Feast of Tabernacle at the time of Jesus on this day involved a water drawing ceremony. The priest would retrieve a picture, a pitcher of water from the pool of Siloam. Now, if the tabernacle is up on the Temple Mount, you go down into the valley, down in the city of David, and there's the pool of Siloam down there. They go and they draw a pitcher of water and take it back up into the temple and would pour it out on a basin on the altar. And this was not just an appeal to heaven for rain, but it was also symbolic of spiritual refreshing and blessing. And they would quote this scripture from Isaiah. Isaiah 12, 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Jesus claimed to be the fulfillment of that ceremony. Except instead of water coming out of the sky in the form of rain, it would come from the depths Just as in the water pouring ceremony, they went and they drew water from the depths of the earth, the pool of Siloam being down in a valley. Jesus is saying that spiritual life and refreshing would come from within, from our innermost being. Jesus used the phrase, as the scriptures say, but where does the scripture say? Well, he was paraphrasing what the scriptures say that living rivers of living water come from within. We can go to Ezekiel chapter 36, 24 to 27. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart And a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It's not exactly word for word the way Jesus said it, but all of the imagery is there. They're going to come into their promised inheritance as celebrated in the sukkah. The water of life, the refreshing, will pour over them, except that it will come from within them, from a new heart and a new spirit. And this is the Holy Spirit that will be poured out upon them. The water ceremony ultimately foreshadowed the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the very presence of God, is what we are really thirsting for. The Holy Spirit is all of that welling up from inside of us. The cloud that was over the tabernacle is now a stream of water coming from a renewed heart and a revitalized spirit. Secondly, let God illuminate your life. That word is illuminate. Another ceremony during the Feast of Tabernacles in Jesus' day was the illumination of the temple. This amazing light show was the most incredible thing in its day. It consisted of lighting four large menorahs at the four corners of the temple complex. Yeah, there's an artist's rendering of what that may have looked like. They were said to be some 70 feet high. 
The lamps had golden bowls. Each were holding about 10 gallons of oil. So it would be kind of like the Olympic torch times four. It would light up the temple grounds like daylight. And the spectacle could be seen from miles around, from all of the surrounding villages, historians would tell us. Imagine how it would be for people who had made the pilgrimage to the feast. First of all, Jerusalem as a city would triple, maybe even quadruple in population during the feast. I'm sure that living in sukkahs actually made it possible for some people to find lodging. You might uh, be sleeping in the sukkah and a relative's rooftop or in their garden. But many people would be forced to find shelter in the surrounding villages. As we read about Jesus and his disciples, what did they do? They went over the hill to Bethany whenever they were in Jerusalem. Around the beginning of the feast, because um, the Feast of Trumpets happens on the new moon, and this is 15 days later, so what would that make it? That would make it full moon, right? When the Feast of Tabernacles is beginning. But as the Feast of Tabernacles is going along, that moon would be becoming smaller and smaller. But this light now is lighting up the hillsides around Jerusalem. So as people are traveling to and from the city, they have this light to travel by. It's lighting up the hillsides. It was in this context that Jesus said these words in John 8, 22. And again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you need light? Do you want to understand what life is all about? Why are you here? What does God want you to do? Jesus not only has the answer, he is the answer. Jesus made a way for you to come back to God, to know God, to know God's love for you. When you give your life to Jesus, it's like turning on the light life will seem much different and a lot of things begin to make sense why because God has illuminated your life with the knowledge of Jesus here's another way that we are refreshed in the present celebrate the fruit of God's promises there's another tradition of the Feast of Tabernacles that is more of a present-day tradition. Celebrants carry the lulav and the etrog. Now, I don't happen to have one here today, but it represents the fruit of the land. I have pictures up there. There you go. You may remember Jill <laughs> having those. Leviticus 23.40, it comes from this verse. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So you got the etrog in one hand, you have the lulav, these other three species in the other hand, and you are to rejoice before the Lord. Literally. Shake it. <laughs> rejoice before the Lord. That's what you're to do. The four representative species are the fruit of the land of Israel. The etrog or citron is a citrus fruit. It's, it's like a lemon. If you don't have an etrog, you can use a lemon. Right? The lulav is a palm branch, a palm frond. And then with it is also bound up the myrtle and the willow, bound together with the lulav. The four species are also said to represent our bodies. The etrog is the heart. The lulav is the spine. The myrtle is the eyes and the willow is the lips. So in waving these before the Lord, what are we doing? We are presenting ourselves. We are presenting our bodies to God. 
in celebration and worship. We're thanking God for the fruit of the harvest, but we're also presenting ourselves to God as his harvest. Lastly, anticipating the future. The Feast of Tabernacles is a foretaste of heaven. On the calendar of the Lord's Feast, the Feast of Tabernacles is the, cult, is the culmination. It's to be a season of joy, not only because the harvest is brought in, but because we can finally rest and enjoy what we have worked so hard for. In eschatological terms, we call this the marriage supper of the Lamb. Listen to this in Revelation 19.9. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. The marriage supper of the Lamb. You remember your wedding day? Barely, right? <laughs> so much goes into preparation. So much goes into getting ready for that day and then that day comes and what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to just enjoy it. That's what everybody tells you. Just, just enjoy it. That's what God's preparing for us. A day when, when that day comes, just enjoy it. This is what you've worked for. This is what you've worked so hard for. When we look back and remember the time we spent in the wilderness and the lessons learned, what we learned about trusting God, then we also look ahead to the culmination of our life with God. This is why we have learned to trust God. I like to tell couples, you know, after the wedding comes the marriage. <laughs> Are you prepared for that? This is why you've worked on your relationship. This is why you have learned to trust one another because you're going to be spending a lot, a lot of time together. Just as the wilderness is to the promised land, so is our earthly existence to our heavenly one. Remember, the sukkah is only temporary. And so it points to a permanent dwelling but here's a little twist I've been saying all along that the sukkah is only temporary but guess what when we get to heaven we will still be celebrating the feast of tabernacles in heaven yes that's right all the nations will celebrate the feast in the kingdom of God this is what it says in Zechariah 14, 16. And everyone who survives of all the nations and have come against Jerusalem, uh, uh, everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. Zechariah is describing the literal, physical reign of Christ on earth. The final battle has ended and Jesus has established his kingdom here on earth. Some call this the millennial reign of Christ. And what's interesting to note is that Zechariah says we will still be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles even after Christ returns. Only it will not just be the Jews celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, but all the nations all of the nations, the ones that are left from the nations that came against Jerusalem will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. In fact, it goes so far as to say that the nations which are not represented will not have rain the following year. I find that interesting. Do you realize... This is the allegiance that God asks for. That we spend time in his presence. That's what God wants from all the nations. Lastly, the presence of God is with us 
forever. I started out by saying that the sukkah is a reminder of the temporary nature of this life and that it's also a symbol or reminder of the presence of God. One thing more needs to be said, and that is that the presence of the Lord is not temporary. The presence of the Lord is permanent. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 says this, Now the point in what we are saying is this, We have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So when God gave Moses the instruction for the tabernacle on the mountain, it was a pattern that was given him from a heavenly tabernacle. Everything about the tabernacle reflected something of heavenly reality. The sukkah also reflects a heavenly reality. The presence of God. The sukkah provides shade from the heat. (laughs) What is it that we, you know, in counseling in the um, the one mile heat is a representation of all of the things that come against us all of the troubles all of the trials and the presence of the Lord provides shade from the heat the symbol may be temporary but the reality is permanent After eight days, the sukkah will come down again. The decorations will be put away. The branches will be thrown out. The poles will be stored for another year. But the presence of God and the renewing that we have experienced is to give us strength to go in for another year. Continuing to abide in God's presence. Here's some questions for reflection. What's the wilderness that God has brought you through? Do you remember? you remember what it was like in the wilderness? How did God sustain you? How did God provide for you? Did God give you manna? Physical, financial, people that he brought into your life. What are some of the miracles that you experienced along the way? It's a good time to remember those things. Secondly, is there a place that you can go to get alone with God? That's another thing that the sukkah is for. A place to get alone with God. What can you use as your sukkah for this season? How would you decorate it? You know, when you decorate a sukkah, you're supposed to decorate it not only with leafy branches, but they would also hang fruit (laughs) from the roof. It wasn't there to eat. It was just there to remind you (laughs) of God's faithfulness. You could eat it on the last day. What are the reminders of God's faithfulness that you would have in your sukkah? Thirdly, how are you refreshed in the presence of God? Is there living water coming from inside you? How has Jesus brought light to your life? And how are you going to give your expression of joy to him. Lord, we thank you for this season. God, we don't have, or at least most of us, I don't think any of us have sukkahs in our backyard. But we all need a place to dwell in your presence. We all need to experience 
the reminders of your faithfulness and to be refreshed by your goodness. Lord, would you do that for us in this place as we worship you? Let's stand together and worship the Lord as we respond to this message.